Every town has its legends. Every neighborhood has its boogeyman. A killer with a hook for a hand. The drifter who snatches children. The witch who lives in the woods. Ours growing up in Staten Island was Cropsy, about an escaped mental patient who lived in these buildings who had snatched children off the street. This urban legend turned real when five neighborhood children went missing. It was these disappearances that led us to examine the real crimes behind the Cropsy urban legend. A grisly discovery of an arm and a leg sticking out from a shallow grave. And what we discovered was a connection to an institution with a shocking history. This is what it looked like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. Understanding the real story behind Cropsy inspired us to investigate other urban legends and the true crimes that may have influenced them. And what we uncovered was a truth more horrific than any fiction. This is where we thought that Cropsy lived, in these buildings here. It's very easy for an urban legend to come out of something like this. Yeah. And we didn't think anything of it until kids started going missing on Staten Island. And then we were like, Cropsy's real. But do you think every urban legend has truth behind it? Yes, I think you have to have some form of like truth to kind of go off of. There's a lot of other urban legends and a lot of other communities that have some form of truth behind them. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is all these communities have all these places. Well, every kid is lured to or fascinated by the old house at the end of their block. These are the stories that fuel your nightmares, and these are the places that fuel your nightmares. So why are you here today? You hear stories. You just want to see what's about, I guess. What do you guys expect to find out here? People who died here are supposed to be the ghosts. Do you believe that they're devil worshippers? Oh, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Somebody said they were doing freaky experiments and crap like that. Why do we believe these urban legends? Maybe we need to believe, because the reality is too much for some of us to bear. An old legend that actually happened this time. Many more cases of contaminated treats. I know she suffered a lot. He pulled a knife and tied me up with electrical tape. Oh, God. And so instead, we create our own monsters. A 36-year-old building contractor who reportedly dressed like a clown. At least three young boys buried under his house. And maybe that's because the truth is more terrifying than we could ever imagine. I got seven down in feet or not. Seven down. Got a child victim. I need rescue. For Rachel and me, this is an attempt to uncover the source of our nightmares as we pull back the curtains on what it is we all fear. Because urban legends, as scary as they may be, are really just warnings for something much more dangerous. The reality that may have started it all. The Hook is one of the oldest and also one of the scariest urban legends. A teenage couple are making out in their car while parked at a lover's lane. As the two are about to go all the way, the radio interrupts them. A crazed maniac with a hook for a hand has escaped from the local insane asylum. The frightened girl demands to go home as the frustrated boy guns the engine. Later, as the boyfriend goes to open his date's door, he sees dangling from the door handle the maniac's bloody hook ripped from its socket. The hook urban legend probably uh, came to be in the mid-1950s. One of the interesting appearances of The Hook was in November 1960, when it actually appeared in the Dear Abby column, and it's something that a lot of people would have read. But Dear Abby wasn't warning teenagers about escaped madman with hooks for hands. Urban legends are more mysterious than that, and never quite so literal. Despite its name, The Hook is a cautionary tale, warning teenagers everywhere about the dangers of sex. 
the hook urban legend captured something in the era that, that people were interested in. It captured a certain amount of danger being involved in teenage sexual behavior and in teenage car culture. For the teenagers in Texarkana, Texas, this wasn't just some cautionary tale. In the early spring of 1946, a masked man known as the Phantom attacked four couples, most of whom were parked on lovers' lanes. The attacks, which killed five, were said to coincide with the full moon, hence the nickname, the Moonlight Murders. And although there were numerous suspects, the Phantom was never caught, allowing his enduring legacy to haunt this town for more than six decades. So this is South Robeson, and this is Old Highway 67. The murder site is somewhere around here, but that's what we gotta kinda figure out. It was a rainy Sunday morning on March 24th when a passing motorist noticed Richard Griffin's Oldsmobile parked on a lover's lane off Highway 67. Inside, he found Griffin, age 29, and Polly Ann Moore, 17, lying in the back seat. Both had been shot in the back of the head. Hey, guys, how you doing? What we're doing is we're investigating the Phantom Killer. They had a lot of speculations on who did it, but it was never, no one was ever brought to justice. Did you hear stories growing up? All I ever heard was, don't go to Spring Lake Park. Really? Uh -huh. Why? It's kind of creepy out there, so I don't know, but we were always afraid to go there. But did you still go? <laughs> no. We're having a little trouble finding out where the area is, but because everything's Well, too... I can take you out there to the, to the road and point to almost a spot. Right about there. Right uh -huh. there. And on, that, on that side. Like the couple in the urban legend, Griffin and Moore had been attacked while parked on Lover's Lane, highlighting the warning behind this campfire tale. But what the residents in Texarkana didn't know, because it wasn't reported in the papers, were the horrific details behind this real-life crime. They had found evidence of blood and a blanket, mm -hmm. and they believed that she was raped out in front of the car and then put back in the car. The first double murder didn't cause a lot of excitement. All kinds of crimes were going in in Texarkana, but they didn't recognize to some time later that this was a different kind of crime. The term serial killer wasn't in vogue then, right. and no one recognized this as a serial killing. The main suspect was Yul Sweeney, who was an ex-convict. Yul Sweeney and his newlywed bride, a former prostitute named Peggy, had been arrested for stealing cars. Under questioning, the wife confessed that her husband was the Phantom, but refused to sign a statement. Although the case quickly fell apart, the judge still sent Sweeney away for life as a habitual car thief. No evidence directly correlating. No physical Sweeney. evidence. They had the, his wife's statement, but they could not use that without her permission. There had been a lot of other suspects, hundreds. People had theories and all kinds of rumors had been bouncing around. But it's normal in any event, especially when there's mystery as there was always mystery in this one. Texarkana is nothing like other towns. It seems to be wallowing in the notoriety. Documentary team in town to shoot a part of Texarkana history. This week, some Texarkana residents will have the chance to appear on screen in a documentary film of the Phantom Killer. So what should we make of all this? The conclusion is simple. Texarkana will never escape its past. It should give up trying. It was a half moon on February 22nd when Jimmy Hollis, age 24, and Mary Jean LeRae, 19, were attacked on a secluded lover's lane. Both survived after a car scared the assailant away. Around midnight, Mary Jean LeRae, Jimmy Hollis, making out of the front seat of their car, all of a sudden, a guy appears with a gun, wearing a mask over his head. White, two, two holes cut out for eyes and mouth. Tells her to run. He chases her down and then starts to attack her, basically sexually assaults her with the barrel of his gun. She said she'd much rather have been killed like the others than to have been left the way she was. While the attacks on lovers' lanes in Texarkana didn't specifically involve a hook, the Phantom's sickening crimes created an equally horrifying metaphor. One of the victims was actually sexually assaulted with the barrel of a gun. And so we have the idea of a foreign metal object being used in this way, which seems to be psychologically behind the idea of the hook. In the hook story, we have the hook about to penetrate the car when the boy drives away and the hook is then ripped from the hand of the murderer. So we have the idea of penetration with a foreign metal object is already part of that story. And that, in fact, happened in the Texarkana cases. 
but the sexual assault was only part of the Phantom's trademark signature. These two people are the only ones who ever saw the Phantom, both wearing masks. Right, they both said both that the guy was wearing a mask. So this is the whole thing where the whole white mask thing came from. The Phantom's disguise was another chilling detail as it also helped to popularize the most widely known retelling of the murders in the 1976 cult classic, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The movie is thought to be one of the first slasher films, having predated Halloween by two years, and its take on the Phantom would influence generations of cinematic boogeymen. The director, Charles B. Pierce, blurred the lines between fact and fiction by telling the film in faux documentary style. It was Sunday, March 3rd, 1946. The beginning of a reign of terror for the people of Texarkana, a terror so indelibly imprinted that today, people still speak of it fearfully. Only the names have been changed. Now, I think everybody in Texarkana knows about the story of the Phantom Killers, but there's a lot of intermingling of facts and legend between the movie and the actual Phantom Killer case. This is Casey Roberts, media manager at Texas A&M Texarkana. He's done extensive research on the crimes and brought us to one of the locations where the town that dreaded sundown was filmed. A lot of the kind of landmarks from both the original case of the Phantom Killer and the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown are going away over the years. And this particular house here was used in you know, one of the big scenes. It was Friday, May 3rd, when Virgil and Katie Starks were attacked in their farmhouse just outside of town. Virgil was shot and killed in his armchair, <laughs> while Katie, shot in the face, ran out of the house. Everybody seems convinced that Yul Sweeney is the guy, but you're saying... Yul Sweeney would have been easy to pin it on, and they needed to pin it on somebody. The one person that I haven't been satisfied he was cleared was a young man that committed suicide and left a note saying he was the phantom killer. It's just part of the legend, the uh, son of the prominent family that had the connections to, you know, cover up his dirty deed. Hoping to dig up more information, we went searching through the microfiche of the Texarkana Gazette. Promising lead proves dud. So this is the mention of the Yul Sweeney. The officers had been trying to validate the story of a woman. The woman's statement followed so closely to the known facts of the case that they were almost positive that she was telling the truth that at one point they were almost to the point of announcing a break in the case. Subsequently, however, the woman said that neither she nor her husband had anything to do with the slayings. Hmm. It's interesting, so they don't call him the Phantom at all in this, but we just saw literally uh, the advertisement in the newspaper for the movie that's showing the Phantom Speaks. And this is the movie that they theoretically pulled the name from. And right here at the newspaper, one of the guys said, well, why don't we call him something? We need right. to call him something. Let's call him the Phantom. We had just witnessed an important step in the creation of any urban legend, the naming of the boogeyman. One of the roles that urban legends play, and this is an ancient function, is that they will put a name on something that gives people fears or anxieties that gives the person some feeling of control. So give the murderer a name. He's the Phantom Murderer. The mask, the movie, the Phantom. These were the crucial elements that would help create Texarkana's very own urban legend, a legend that would only continue to grow with screenings of the town that dreaded sundown, held every year in Texarkana's Spring Lake Park. All of this area was part of Spring Lake Park mm -hmm. at the time, and this is where a couple of the places where the murders happened. That was where Lover's Lane was. You basically set up the screening that you have a town that dreaded sundown at uh, Spring Lake Park. Yes, we do it every October. Because of the history, we like the idea of having this out at Spring Lake Park, since that's where some of the murders take place at. We started getting some phone calls saying that they didn't think it was right, that there were still families in town that, you know, that was affected by this. The police concern was is that it was going to cause somebody else to have the idea to start doing it again. The film crew was in town last month, mm -hmm. and there's a new movie being yes. made. What we've heard is that it was actually the, a remake of The Town That Dreads Sundown. It's, it's you know, um, just a, probably a more modern version of it. I've heard that the storyline of the movie is about a copycat that comes out from the screenings uh, that happen at Spring Lake. Are you serious? 
That's the first I've heard about that. Well, you know, imitation of life, I guess. While it may seem shocking to some, the screenings at Spring Lake Park were especially appropriate because it was here on April 14th where the Phantom turned larger than life. 400 yards from the entrance to Spring Lake Park where the sign is, they found Paul Martin's car empty. In yet another attack, not only had the Phantom murdered two teenagers in the center of town, but their deaths would incite a panic that would grip Texarkana and never let go. Betty Jo Booker, age 15, was a saxophonist for a high school band called the Rhythm Airs that played weekend shows at the local VFW. At 1.30 a.m. that Saturday night, she left with a childhood friend named Paul Martin, age 16, who was supposed to drop her off at a slumber party. Paul's body was found lying on its left side. Blood was found further down on the other side of the road by a fence. Right over here, Paul Martin's body's found. He'd been shot twice, and then he crawled across the street over to here. And then whoever did it shot him again twice. They said he put up a struggle. He had a uh, bullet through his hand, right. raised his hand, probably begged not to be killed, and then they found him at 6.30 in the morning. Betty Jo Booker was nowhere around. Although supposedly only the names had been changed in the town that dreaded sundown, one of the most egregious fictionalizations had Betty Jo Booker playing the trombone instead of the saxophone, the reason being to show a more terrifying demise. The scene was so Don't memorable, me. some people no. in town actually think oh, that's how she died. No. <laughs> <laughs> The actual site of where Betty Jo Booker's body was found, along the edge of a forgotten road, had eluded many. Lost in time when a section of the park was turned into housing, this was one mystery we were determined to solve. She was found two miles away from Martin's body. The road's closed. Here's where we think this road continues on. See that line mm -hmm. between those two trees? Totally. That's the road that's been overgrown. Keep that flashlight down. Just turn it down for a while. This looks exactly like the old road. Yeah. It is the old road, basically, that we just went through somebody's backyard to get to. What is it? It's oh, a huge spider web. It's halfway between the two ends. This is Betty Jo Booker, 15 years old. Shot twice, once to the left rib, and once in the face, the left cheek. Well, she's fully, fully clothed. clothed. Yeah. Her overcoat's been buttoned up, and her hand was put in her pocket. Strange. Mm -hmm. See that picture for a second? Does it look like it? Like, if you're looking at it like that, add 60 years. Uh-huh. That could very well be it. It could be. I feel bad that, you know, we're never going to really know who killed her. What happened to Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker out on these roads over 60 years ago was horrific enough. Their deaths didn't need to be rewritten for more blood or gore. Coming out here, you realize that real life is just as scary as any horror film, and sometimes even more. This is Mark Bledsoe, a former probation officer who was obsessed with the case and conducted his own investigation. I developed a passion, I guess, in the 90s. Uh, I, I, I saw the film, of course, when I was a seventh grader. <laughs> and I was pretty scared because the way it, the, the film ends, it shows the boots and said he could still be walking the town. I wanted to know what the truth was. Bledsoe was one of the only people to interview Yul Sweeney in recent years. Sweeney, who was out of jail and living in a Texas nursing home, had suffered a stroke the year before, making a speech difficult to decipher. You spent a lot of your life in the penitentiary. 50, 60 years. Well, she said you and her went together to Spring Lake Park. Yeah, they drove out there together to spring. What do you say? 
tell the damn lie. You were the main suspect of Phantom Killer. No, I wasn't. Who do you think was the main? I don't know. You wish they'd catch her? Mm, interesting. Better way they prove it, wasn't you? You're innocent on that? I feel like there was more there. Despite being so close, we still didn't have an answer as to who the Phantom really was. And we probably never will. What happened to the Phantom Killer, no one really knows. Some believe he was convicted of another crime, and today he is still serving his term in a Kansas prison. It's these lack of answers that allows the legend to endure for the teenagers in Texarkana. And what do you think the next chapter is in that legend? Probably more ghost stories. Maybe more kids trying to scare other kids. Do you think they'll ever end? I think eventually it'll fade out, but I wouldn't be able to say for how long. I mean, legends last for a long time. So this is the tree where, because of the movie, some people think Betty Jo Booker was actually killed with a trombone. I think why this is so kind of important is because so many people believed the fiction and the fiction became reality. In this town, I really think what's interesting is they can't separate the two. Well, I think it's more romantic though to believe in the myth than to have the facts in front of you. You have the whole town coming out and watching a fictionalized version of that. And that's just like little kids telling a fictionalized version of what really happened. That's what an urban legend is. Where does the truth end and the fiction begin? At this point, no one quite knows. Texarkana today still looks pretty much the same. And if you should ask people here on the streets what they believe happened to the Phantom Killer, most would say that he is still living here and is walking free. driving into Houston, we're gonna investigate uh, the urban legend of the Candyman. The name Candyman has a lot of urban legend references. Obviously one of the most well-known is the film Candyman, based on the Clive Barker short story about an urban legend expert investigating the boogeyman who haunts the Cabrini Green housing projects in Chicago. With my hook for a hand, I'll split you from the groin to your gullet. <laughs> Here, the Candyman uses a hook, just like the well-known hook urban legend, where it was probably appropriated from. But the film's villain wasn't the first Candyman. The original was, in fact, a very real monster behind one of the most horrific crimes anyone could ever imagine. We've all heard the same story about Halloween. Little Johnny had been warned to never go trick-or-treating at any house he didn't know, but he didn't listen. Instead, he convinces his friends to go get candy from this one weird house. Later that night, as they're all digging through their loot, there's this scream. All the kids are rushed to the hospital, but it's too late. Johnny's dad from eating candy leaves with poison. And all the other kids had their mouths ripped open from swallowing razor blades and glass. They never to catch the person who did it. Turns out, Halloween really comes from the ancient custom of druids collecting kids for sacrifices. And apparently, these murders were committed by those who still carry on that evil tradition. So does our modern-day custom of trick-or-treating really stem from evil druids and child sacrifices? It's highly unlikely. But there's no denying that something very sinister is out there, instilling panic and inciting fear every Halloween. There's one magical, haunted evening each year when all the scary creatures come out to prowl through every neighborhood. Most people enjoy having trick-or-treaters come to their doors. But there are a few people who will do things to hurt kids. The first documented case of tainted candy happened on Long Island in 1964, when a housewife named Helen File, upset with older kids for trick-or-treating, handed out dog biscuits, steel wool, and poison ant buttons. Although File testified it was just a joke, she was still found guilty of endangering children. This fear really took root in the 1970s, when outlets like Newsweek were reporting that several children had died from poison or tainted candy. 
Some schools stop celebrating Halloween. They start uh, stop using the word Halloween, and they start talking about having a fall festival. New Jersey passed a law specifying penalties for uh, people who were caught contaminating Halloween treats. In the 1980s, hospitals began offering to x-ray treats. All Next Care Urgent Care locations are offering free candy x-rays through tomorrow. We haven't had any instances where we found any tampered candy, but you read it in the news and you see all of these crazy pictures online. And so, you know, if I were a parent, I would be a little bit concerned as well. We don't uh, worry about ghosts and goblins anymore, but we fear this maniac, this anonymous person who is so crazy that uh, uh, he, presumably he, uh, poisons little children at random. I think about how much fun Halloween is. I also worry a little bit about the things that can spoil the fun of Halloween. Those kinds of things scare me too, but in a different way. The one case of tainted candy that seemed to bring this nightmare to life happened on a rainy Halloween night in Pasadena, Texas. The perpetrator of this evil crime is known to some as the man who killed Halloween, and to others is simply the candy man. On October 31st, 1974, after trick-or-treating with their friends, the Bateses, Ronald O'Brien let his son Timothy, age eight, and his sister Elizabeth, five, each pick out a piece of candy before bed. Timothy, still wearing his Planet of the Apes costume, chose a giant pixie stick, one of five that his father had gotten from a neighborhood house that night. Ronald had divvied up the other sticks to his daughter, one of the Bates kids, and a local boy named Whitney Parker. The sugar inside had clumped together, so Ronald rolled the sticks in his hands before pouring the powder down his son's throat. Minutes later, Timothy was violently vomiting, and after being rushed to the hospital, he was pronounced dead. The cause? Cyanide poisoning. I was off duty at the time on Halloween night when I received a call from uh, one of my detectives. I drove to Southmore Hospital, and what I saw was very, very disturbing, not only because there was a child there that was dead that had cyanide foam coming out of his mouth, but it was a small, blonde-headed young boy and I looked at this child, and I had at the time a small, blonde-headed, eight-year-old son lying in a bed in my home. And it absolutely just almost destroyed you to see something like that. Had you ever heard of the idea of candy tampering before that? I had heard about it. I had never seen personally. But, you know, you're always concerned uh, on Halloween. And uh, the next night, we had a grieving uh, father, a grieving mother, and a grieving little sister. I put my arm around Mr. O'Brien's shoulder and I promised him, I promise you, we will catch this individual that did this to your son. Timothy's death was a terrible blow, not just for the family, but for many in Pasadena, as crowds of O'Brien's fellow churchgoers flooded the cemetery. Timothy's father quickly reduced the mourners to tears as he sang a hymn for the boy who is now in heaven. I introduced myself to Mr. O'Brien and said, I'm a reporter for the Houston Chronicle. Is Mrs. O'Brien available to talk? He said, you know, she's, she's really, as we all are, just torn up about this. But if, if, if you want to talk, come on in and, and I'll try to talk to you. Uh, and he said, you know, I held my son in my arms while he died and I cried. I thought that they had been victimized by a, a random crazy man, lunatic. The original suspects were people in Pasadena who were living inhabitants of the homes where they did the trick-or-treat. 4106, 4106. Is that 02? Right here. Yeah. 4102. All right, so right here is the Bates house from where uh, O'Brien and the Bateses both went trick-or-treating. After the funeral, the police took O'Brien around the Bates neighborhood, but he couldn't remember the house where he had gotten the pixie stick. Finally, he ID'd a neighbor named Courtney Melvin. Ten. Right here where this blue car is. This is Courtney Melvin's place. So basically, Courtney was out on his lawn. O'Brien was driving by, fingered this guy as being the person where he got the pixie sticks. The only problem being, Courtney Melvin had an airtight alibi. As the killer continued to elude police, the nature of his crime only seemed to confirm everyone's worst fears, a fear that still resonates today. Do you know about the crime that happened? Oh, uh, yeah, she talked about the candy man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the first step that I heard of people doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I heard they putting more cyanide and uh, razor blades. I've heard fish hooks. 
the way the society is getting right now, I mean, you, you don't ever know what's going to happen. I'm like, nope, no candy until I look, you know, mm -hmm. What are you looking it. for? You know, an open wrapper, just seeing if anything has a hole in it. You don't trust nobody. Yeah. Can't. I actually heard about some guy doing it in this neighborhood one time. But what's that story? I think he actually lived over there by the ditch. Uh -huh. And they do all that sacrifice crap over there during Halloween. Do you think there's Satanists around? There probably is. I mean, no one in this neighborhood. There's sickos around here. Tonight is Halloween and children will be out to trick or a treat. We hope that the treats will be many and the tricks ingenious. But sometimes people give children bad things on Halloween. In Shreveport, Louisiana, an old legend that actually happened this time. Halloween is on Sunday, and there's a spreading fear that this year the real Halloween scare will be many more cases of contaminated treats. The term that gets used is Halloween sadist. People assume that the Halloween sadist was some crazy person who, uh, for some reason, presumably, you know, some, some psychological problem, gets pleasure or satisfaction from hurting little kids. Many people believe the Halloween sadist was behind Timothy's death. But the real culprit was more horrific than anyone had ever imagined. It's down here, I think, on the left. All right, so Greg, how do you want to do this? So I'll just I'll hang back here. OK, so we're going to go up. I'm not totally into this. I, I can understand. I can understand why you'd want to do this. Yeah. It just makes me feel a little uncomfortable knocking on someone's house and tell them, telling them what tragedy happened here. Well, you wouldn't want to know. Oh, hey, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hey, sorry to bother you. We wanted to talk to you. We're doing a documentary, and we want to talk to you about the family that lived here before. Do you know him? You know Ronald Clark O'Brien? Mm -hmm. No, you don't have no idea about him? I have no idea. I've never seen him. Something scary happened here or something? Ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, thanks very <laughs> much. You want to know? You, you really want to know? Yeah. Do you really want to know? So the guy who lived in here was a guy named Ronald Clark O'Brien. He gave his son a poison pixie stick. <laughs> he was the murderer? Yeah. He the killed it. That That's right. A good drop. On Halloween night, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien of Pasadena, Texas, died after eating a piece of trick-or-treat candy that contained cyanide. Today, Pasadena police arrested the boy's father, 30-year-old Ronald O'Brien, on murder charges. Police refused to discuss the case other than to say the district attorney believes he has sufficient evidence to file charges. After receiving a call from an insurance agent, police discovered O'Brien had taken out a large policy on his kids, but not himself, nor his wife. Even more damning, he had talked to numerous people about death by cyanide, and had even tried to buy the chemical from local companies. All evidence pointed to Timothy's father as the killer, which, as horrific as it sounds, makes some sense. And that's because the Halloween sadist is a myth, and the notion of candy tampering is really an urban legend. The idea that this is a big social problem is a myth. I can't tell you that nobody's ever contaminated a piece of candy, but I can't find any evidence that anybody has ever been hurt, seriously hurt or killed from a contaminated treat picked up in the course of trick-or-treating. If there's no such thing as the Halloween sadist, who is in fact doing that? <laughs> Probably the kids. If you think about it, this is a terrific kind of prank. It's easy enough to come by a pin and easy enough to stick it into the candy bar and then run in and say, look, mom, there's a pin in my candy bar. And you become the object of the concerned attention of uh, your parents and possibly even the press and the police. While a fear of tainted candy may be hysteria, Timothy's death was real. But was it really conceivable that a father could kill his own child? And if so, what kind of monster was Ronald Clark O'Brien? Look at that line, son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. I thought, just like Mr. O'Brien wanted us to think, that there was some maniac out there randomly giving these poison pixie sticks to little kids. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he wanted us to think, and that's what we thought. It's hard to, uh, to, to accept that a human being was willing to do that. And it is, uh, it's still difficult for all of us. There's, the people in this case were uh, forever affected by what he did, and by that I mean uh, the Bates kids. He was going to kill his friends on two kids and little Whitney Parker. And he would have killed his daughter if the ambulance and police hadn't gotten there so fast. No good prosecutor wants to go to trial at all on anything unless they believe in their own heart that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And seeking the death penalty is just an extra dimension 
of care and consideration that should be given. You wanted to keep the case? I sure did. Why? I wanted to hopefully have a hand in seeing that justice was done and that he would die for what he did. It took a jury only 45 minutes to find O'Brien guilty and another 75 to sentence him to death. In a fitting irony, he was scheduled to die on October 31st, 1976, Halloween. I have stated from the very beginning that I had absolutely nothing at all to do with this. I maintain that now. I am willing to take a polygraph now, just like I was from the very first time they arrested me. Because I have no guilt, I'm not worried about what happens to my physical body. When I die, I know where I'm going. You're going straight to hell, buddy. All these appeals have been turned down, appeal after appeal, and everybody's saying you will be executed this Saturday. This could be your last news conference. What are your final thoughts? As long as I have verifiable options open to me, I will pursue it. Are you ever going to change your proclamation of innocence? Or no, why should I? It's the truth. When you consider victims, the victim of this crime actually turns out to be me. O'Brien had been sent to Texas's infamous Huntsville prison, which to this day houses the most active death chamber in the U.S. But this was 1982, and after a lengthy debate in the Supreme Court and numerous days of execution, O'Brien was to be one of the very first inmates to be executed under the reinstituted death penalty. Yet despite his crime, O'Brien still managed to find his supporters. There were people who were in favor of saving Ronald Clark O'Brien in spite of the overwhelming evidence and the horror of the crime. Their position was, we are categorically opposed to the death penalty. There also were counter protesters who were in favor of the death penalty. They included a lot of students from the university located here, including many who complained about what had happened to Halloween. This is Ronald Clark O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien is 39 years old. It looks like you're going to be executed. Would you agree with that? It's a possibility. I've been aware of that possibility since the sentence was handed down. It doesn't make it right. It's fair to say that nobody gets any joy out of executing anybody, but it is also clear that most Americans want to get on with this. They are upset that you're alive. I, I can see that point, sure. But here again, I don't think so, revenge is right. I don't think society is entitled to revenge. You are accused of ruining Halloween for everybody. Well, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> March 31st, 1984, the day of O'Brien's execution had finally arrived. He was to be executed just after midnight. As the hour approached, the frenzy outside reached a fever pitch. Demonstrators were outside the prison waiting for the announcement they wanted to hear. Parents of other murdered children joined the vigil. You know, how could anyone do something to their own child? What all of us would give to have the chance to have ours back. Do you think Halloween will ever be the same again? Oh, I don't think Halloween has changed a great deal. Uh, except maybe gotten a little safer. At exactly 12.40 a.m., O'Brien was injected with a lethal cocktail of drugs, twice the normal amount to account for his 250-pound weight. After O'Brien's eyes fluttered, his chest heaved, and it was over. Ronald O'Brien, the man fellow inmates called the Candyman, was killed by lethal injection this morning at a Huntsville, Texas prison. Ronald O'Brien went to his deathbed, never admitting that he killed his own son. But in a final statement, the condemned man did ask to be forgiven. To anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask your forgiveness just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. Ronald O'Brien is dead. His ex-wife sees the execution as the end of a nightmare and a chance for a brand new beginning. For many, the idea that we were killing the man who killed Halloween seemed justified. O'Brien had to die so we could have our fun back. People were celebrating it, no question about it, but it was kind of a catharsis, really, and people welcomed the event. He really had not just desecrated the family tie, but he had actually, in some fundamental way, desecrated uh, the idea of Halloween by taking a scary story and literally making it true. What he did is he used the urban legend as a smokescreen. He used it as an alibi. 
I couldn't have done it because this is the sort of thing that an anonymous creepy killer would do. And we all know that because of urban legends. In the ultimate irony, O'Brien's decision to enact the tainted candy myth turned fiction into reality, allowing the candy man to continue haunting Halloween for generations to come. Look, it's right there. Mr. O'Brien, your case has probably created terror in the hearts of uh, parents. In fact, I'm told that the uh, inmates occasionally refer to you as the candy man. Is that so? A babysitter is watching TV after putting the kids to bed when she gets a call from a mysterious stranger. Hello? Have you checked the children? What? Thinking it's a prank, she hangs up. A few minutes later, the same mysterious man calls again. Hello? Have you checked the children? Only now the question ends with a devilish laugh. The babysitter reports the call. Hello, could you get me the police? I've been getting weird phone calls. After a few minutes, a hurried voice calls back. Leave me alone! Jill, this is Sergeant Sacker. Listen to me. We've traced the call. The caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. It's coming from inside the house. Just at that moment, the babysitter looks over as a man is coming down the stairs. Well, that really happened to a girl in my hometown. Oh, yes. I'm sure it did. I'm... I'm sure most of you grew up thinking that this happened to girls in, in all your hometowns, but it didn't. Yes, the babysitter and the man upstairs is a popular urban legend, but is there any truth behind it? One would think so, considering all these examples. But when dealing with urban legends, the truth is never quite what it seems. When I think babysitter, I think about me babysitting as a teenager and how fearful I was. You know, being in a strange house, hearing strange sounds, not being familiar. But what's interesting is that I started researching babysitters thinking that I wouldn't have a hard time finding a case of a babysitter befalling some kind of death or kidnapping, the children upstairs being killed or whatever. It's very difficult to find any true crime to connect this urban legend with. One thing that's interesting about babysitting is that it doesn't increase your danger of being attacked at all. It would be a completely random event for a babysitter to be attacked during a house burglary. But it induces anxiety because suddenly they're responsible for these other people's kids. It has nothing to do with your potential for becoming a crime victim, but it may be getting expressed in stories in which the babysitter becomes a crime victim. You would think with the amount of babysitters getting killed in popular culture and that, like, we would have just, like, got a case immediately. Well, it took me to going back to the 50s to actually find one. We found this case of uh, Jeanette Christman here in Columbia, Missouri, which is why we're here. My name is Carol Haley Holt, and I was a very good friend of Jeanette Christman from first grade through the time of her death. It was March 18, 1950. Jeanette was babysitting for the Romack family out kind of in the west edge of Columbia. It really wasn't in the city limits. It was a kind of an eerie night. I also was babysitting, and I just felt uneasy, and, and that was unusual for me because I did quite a bit of babysitting. But I just felt that something was going on about 12 o'clock, and I even got up to check the door, make sure it was locked, went in to check the little boy. He was fine. And then the next morning, the phone rang. My mother went in to answer and told me that Jeanette had been killed while she was babysitting. I had heard that there had been a phone call to the police well, Mrs. Romack tried to call to check on Jeanette with the thunder, and she was afraid the little boy might wake up. And she tried to call and received a busy signal. What the Romack family didn't know is that Jeanette had called the police while she was being attacked. But the only thing they heard were desperate screams. Unable to trace the call, the police were helpless to stop her murder. Jeanette had skin under her fingernails. Um, she had many abrasions on her body. 
But the final thing was that she was strangled with an ironing cord. I know she suffered a lot before she finally succumbed. Jeanette Chrisman's death shocked the small town of Columbia, Missouri. But despite being one of the most publicized crimes in the past 60 years, her murder has never been solved. So right now we're looking for Ed Romack's house where Jeanette Chrisman was murdered while she was babysitting. 1015 should be somewhere along here. So then it must be that one. That house right, right there? Right there. Quick question for you. Is this where Ed Romack used to live? Is that this house? Maybe. So you don't know anything about it? No. That's where they've been here for a really long time. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, this car pulled up, the neighbor out there talking and pointing here at this house. And they said, we're trying to figure out which house where a girl was babysitting, a little baby, and she got murdered and raped. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's not this house, it's that one. Mm -hmm. It was the man talked to me. He, he said, baby. I was the baby. No. <laughs> and wow. A different woman that lived across Swiss Boulevard, and she had been raped and murdered not sometime within close to that mm -hmm. time. Jenkins, is it? Yes. 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 Jenkins, yes. right. We went to, I went to the trial, yeah. Mary Lou Jenkins was the other reason we were in Columbia. On February 6, 1946, Mary Lou, age 20, was home alone while her mother was out caring for an elderly neighbor. The next morning, she came home to find Mary Lou dead. Much like Jeanette Christman's murder four years later, Mary Lou had been raped and strangled with an electrical cord. A mentally challenged man named Floyd Cochran, who had been arrested for killing his wife, was charged with the murder and quickly executed. Do you think Floyd was innocent? I think he was likely innocent of killing Mary Lou Jenkins, yes. He did kill his wife, and likely domestic dispute. But just from reading the trial transcripts, it just didn't seem like he had the wherewithal to kill and rape a young woman. Mary Beth Brown is a researcher who helps shed new light on these old cold cases. She believes the eerie similarities between the Jenkins murder and the Chrisman murder four years later only proves Cochran's innocence. They were both young women. They were home by themselves. They were both found with electrical cords wrapped around their neck, but cords that weren't attached or torn from the appliance, they were actually cut. The whole location thing is the one that really gets me. Like how close? Within they, two blocks. Do you think that the same person who killed Mary Lou Jenkins also killed Jeanette Christman? That's my personal opinion, but yeah. And who do you think did it? I've been told several people, but more than any other name was Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was a high school friend of Ed Romax, and it was the Romax house where Jeanette was babysitting that night. The Romax told police that Mueller had often commented on Jeanette being a virgin and had alluded to knowing intimate details of the crime. Although Mueller had been taken in for questioning and passed a polygraph, the police still felt there was enough evidence to arrest him. However, a grand jury refused to indict, and Mueller was never tried for Jeanette's murder. I am working on a documentary, and I'm interested in a cold case that I've been researching, and I wanted to see if there's any information that you could give me. OK, is that, did you just like do something on your system and you see that there's nothing there? Despite numerous efforts to reach out to police, they were less than responsive. Chrisman's case was too old to warrant attention. However, we were able to track down some old case files. This deputy testified that Romack told him Mueller had known Jeanette and admired her well-developed form. <gasps> oh my god. There's her leg. There's the phone. That's the cord around her neck right there. It's one of those irons back then were the thick cords. It's a window that was broken that supposedly whoever did this went in and out of. But the Venetian blinds, if someone were going through there, they'd be yeah, totally ripped up. But the piano, look. Mm -hmm. That's the window that, oh, look, right, duck, a, look. There's the broken glass, and that's yeah. why they're saying nothing's disturbed, because look at the area around it. So inside job. Mm-hmm. Mueller's wife, according to the deputy, had called the girl to babysit at the Mueller home that night and found she'd already been asked by Mrs. Romack. So Mueller tried to get her to babysit that night? Must have been. And she was already babysitting the Romax. Which was how he would know she would be alone. I agree that it sounds like he did it, but maybe, maybe he didn't. There's no solid proof, no hard evidence. Joan Sorrell is another researcher studying the cases. 
She believes other crimes happening in Colombia at the time might be connected to these murders. There were rapes that, that had occurred within that period between the Jenkins murder and, and really? the Kristen murder. Tell me and, about those. Well, there was a rape that was within two blocks to the Christman murder. The girl was, was raped by a man that wore a mask. Really? And when you read the stories, the reports of the Christman murder, when they're talking about Robert Mueller, it turns out that he was interested in the theater and that he made masks. There was a black man named Jake Bradford that they charged, and he had already been in jail, and, and he was charged on the rapes. You assume he was innocent? Of that, they took the wrong man. They really did. Would you say that Columbia has like a history of this? Well, you remember that I was graduating from high school in 51. You would go to the MU football games and you'd stand up for Dixie. What does that mean? The song Dixie? Mm hmm OK. That's a Confederate song. Mm -hmm. Columbia was, was really a, primarily a Confederate town. Basically, this is the story of the young girl. We came here to investigate an urban legend, but what we found was truly shocking. The unsolved murders of two young girls, a series of brutal rapes, and the possibility that men were being falsely accused and even executed. In all honesty, the truth was more unflinchingly real than we could have ever imagined. So right now, we are headed to Hinkson Creek. This is where a lot of people went to park back in the 50s and 40s, 50s, 60s, probably still do now. Yeah. We just wanted to see about all the other rapes that were happening other than the two houses. This is the, the creek where they're saying there were a ton of rapes happening around here. Oh. <laughs> that. Um, this is where the college students go in, and there's like a car right out over there. They just flash their lights because they didn't want us to walk in on them. What's down here? Uh, where they dragged the girl. Dragged? Dragged from the car. There was a couple making out. Some guy came out of nowhere and then at gunpoint pulled one of the girls off into the woods. It was right near Halloween, and basically this guy put a mask over his head and then he put a mask over the girl's face, and then he raped her. I think the more scary thing is being a woman, being a girl in between 1940 and 1950 in this area, knowing the amount of things going on. I wouldn't have wanted to be a babysitter back then. I wouldn't have wanted to be my, by myself in one of those houses. Most teenagers in, in the U.S. go through a period when they babysit at least once or twice. And it feels very terrifying to the person who's doing it. But it's not actually dangerous almost at all. I mean, there's no reason to imagine that any killer would even know that a babysitter was on duty in a house. And it makes the most sense if you think about the fact that maybe he knew she was going to be there babysitting, and maybe he did this specifically to torment the babysitter. And that is exactly what happened, they think, in the Columbia case. Was somebody tormenting the babysitters in Columbia? And was the same person responsible for the sex crimes that had terrorized this town? And finally, was this same person Robert Mueller? Hoping for some additional insight, we turned to a profiler in Kansas City, a former German national named Peter Brandt, who was willing to review our case. So in your opinion, the same killer for both girls? Yeah, so this is too specific if you add all the details together. Do you think that Mary Lou Jenkins knew him? Well, there was no sign of forced entry on the door, so at least from the side, she must have known him, and he was non-threatening to her. Mm -hmm. Right. Now let's talk about Chrisman. Oh, well, this is, this is a lot more specific. If you see, there comes an offender. He breaks a window. The victim runs to the kitchen where the phone is, and he walks in through the front door. Now, <laughs> why would he do that? He would do that only if he knew one detail. Ed Romack have sh had shown her how to use the shotgun. Peter had brought up an interesting clue, one that many had overlooked. Romack testified that he had shown Jeanette a loaded shotgun by the front door. By breaking the window, Mueller would distract her away from the gun so he could safely get inside the house. He knew how long he would need around the house, through the front door, into the kitchen. So he knew every feet of the ground. Do you think it was Mueller? He fits the bill, but a lot of other males of the time would fit that bill too. And the problem is he passed his lie detector. Now, uh, if you have even, uh, let's say, 20 to 40% psychopaths in the mix, a lie detector, 
especially an old model from the 50s. Mm. Uh, mm. Well, it's worthless. Now, the other interesting thing is that the rapes and murders stopped when he left town. Well, that looks not good. But on the <laughs> other side, what was it? Half a million uh, young males went to Korea. So yeah. he wasn't the only one who left the area. I mean, he would so nicely fit the bill, but that's, that's the risky part with profiles. Yeah? Uh, a profile says not who the killer is, but what, what the killer is. I think it's interesting that he thinks that whoever this is, he knew her, he knew both. Although we'll never be able to prove who committed all these crimes, the evidence strongly suggests that Jeanette Chrisman knew her killer. There really is not a strong tradition in America of strangers coming in and killing babysitters. Babysitters killing small children, yes, but the stranger on babysitter story just doesn't connect up with a widespread real social fear. What the babysitter and, and the man upstairs seems to be about is this warning about this kind of responsibility. If you're taking this responsibility, you have to take it seriously. So you have this voice that calls her up on the phone and almost like a conscience asks, have you checked the children? And she hasn't checked the children and that's one of the reasons why she doesn't know that they've been murdered. I think it makes more sense to look at it in a simple way and say, uh, the babysitter is dealing with her own anxieties of being potentially the cause of the children's death. And the killer upstairs is the killer upstairs for her. The tragic case of Jeanette Chrisman only goes to prove Bill Ellis's point, that our portrayal of the man upstairs is incorrect. And that's because the truth is more terrifying than we can ever imagine. Jeanette Chrisman knew her killer, and if it's true that her killer was Mueller, as so many in Columbia have suggested, then the man tormenting her that fateful night wasn't any stranger. So now we go from Columbia, Missouri, to Chicago in the 1980s, from the small town to the big city. For some, it is a loss of innocence, and nothing speaks to that loss more than clowns. We used to think of clowns as fairly happy characters. Yes, sometimes they were sad or hapless, but ultimately they were harmless caricatures. Of course, clown faces were exaggerated and garish, but that's because of the far distances between the audience and the ring. It wasn't a clown's fault, or was it? Before modern times, the clown, or more appropriately, the jester, was considered a mischievous trickster whose special role allowed them to mock nobility. Jesters served to entertain, but it wasn't all smiles. These clowns had a mean streak, and they played it to the hilt. But what was it about the clowns of today that turned them into something evil? Breakfast! I'm hungry! Some believe it was when we brought clowns out of the big top and into our homes via birthday parties and TV that things really began to change. We see you here as Bozo. Who are you really? Had that suspicious gleam in the eye been there all along? Did we finally just put two and two together to realize that clowns were creepy or even worse? Dangerous? News at five. Chicago police warn parents about a man dressed as a clown who is approaching children. Police say a clown tried to lure boys into his pickup truck last Tuesday evening. Police have issued two community alerts regarding the clown sighting near some south side schools as well as some west side schools. No one can say for sure where in Chicago it happened first or even when. But they were out there snatching kids off the streets. They trolled playgrounds and schoolyards. Sometimes they used balloons or candy to lure the gullible ones. But ask anyone who's seen them, and they'll all tell you the same thing. It was the white van they saw first, and then that face behind the wheel, painted white with a maniacal smile. We called them the killer clowns, and they only wanted one thing, to kidnap kids just like us. 
Police say that the suspect wears clown makeup, a wig, and sometimes he carried balloons. The latest pair of incidents occurred near playgrounds at 83rd and Mackinac. They were running out of the playground area. To prey on children at this time, you know, right around the time where they want to go out and do trick-or-treating. Um, it's unfortunate. We should emphasize that nothing has happened. No child has been hurt. But certainly these incidents that have been near children is making it very uneasy. 2008, this was one of the reported sightings in South Mackinac, one of the theoretical clown abductions. And apparently he was hiding in the playground with some balloons. Or he's in a van, or he's in a truck. I mean, no adult said they saw this. Something was going on with these children to feel the need to alert adults. Doing a documentary? Yeah, we are. Do you believe that really happened? Yeah, oh, well, sure. Why do you believe that happened? Well, people told me, you know, that, that actually they had actually seen that. Was it just one incident, or was it? No, it was like a couple weeks or you know, uh -huh. a month or something like that that was going on. Mm -hmm. Did they ever catch the guy? I'm not sure. I think they did, because it stopped. <laughs> Definitely it was a, it was a, a true incident. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah. So, he believes? He believes that. It was, it was real. I think there could possibly have been a clown here. It's hard to discern. A white van, and the guy had a mask mm -hmm. of a clown. One of our friend's daughters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she was holding on like for dear life to the fans. Really? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Do you believe it really happened? I believe so. We have tons and tons of pedophiles in this community. I always log on to. Really? Um, oh, yes. Dressing as a clown? Yeah. <laughs> That's a little extreme, don't you think? No. But you never saw the clown? No, but we saw people that acted like that person trying to lure, tell the kids. I saw them right in the store, and I, I warned the store owner. I like for people to hear the truth, and they're not a lie. Now I don't know what to think. Walking away, it was hard not to believe that there must be some truth to this. Could all these people really be wrong? Maybe our fear of clowns isn't just in our heads. Colrophobia is a fear of clowns. It's so widespread now that, you know, everybody, everybody knows that people are afraid of clowns. Everybody knows that something's up with clowns. And the last couple of decades have just been confirmation of everything they ever feared. But what's even more disturbing is that these phantom clowns didn't just appear in 2008. There was a similar sighting 17 years previously, in the fall of 1991. From the number of alleged sightings coming from practically all over Chicago, police are theorizing there may be more than one phony clown roaming the streets. Uh, this is a comment. I seen the same van with a clown driving when we was on the west side playing, and I can recall the van stopping in the alley and the clown trying to lure me to the van. That scared me worse than living in Cabrini Green projects. The mention of Cabrini Green was telling. It had been one of Chicago's most notorious slums, where kids face rampant poverty and violence on a daily basis. But how does a kid process these overwhelming societal issues that are just too big to fix? Have you ever, like, heard of any talk about any scary place on your block, place nobody went to? Every block's a scary block. <laughs> Someone's shooting and killing out here. You guys think clowns are scary? Clowns? Yeah. No. Killer clowns. Killer clowns. We've got a real shot here, Bernadette. An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. Sometimes we create monsters. Sometimes we just need to put a face on our fear. Aren't you going to say hello? This is where there was another series of clown sightings back in 91. They called this clown sighting the homie the clown sighting. Back in the early 90s, there was a popular show on In Living Color. Huge character on there, homie the clown. Now, let's show them how homie gets back at Mr. Establishment, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, this is only one of many, many places all over Chicago. There was a, a real citywide scare. The Chicago police were being called. There were, report, there were reports in the news. Isaiah Thompson was a local reporter who grew up in Chicago and wrote about the clowns that seemed to be lurking on every corner. Somehow, and, and, you know, I don't know that anyone knows how, you know, this whole city, this whole, especially like this whole public school network of thousands and thousands of kids all believe the same thing. So, I, you know, it seems like this larger force of nature that had sort of visited itself upon the kids of Chicago. But what the kids in 1991 didn't know was that Chicago had an even earlier clown scare. There was another clown scare phenomenon previously in 1981. It's been said that that one started in Boston. You think 81, you think 80s, you think Stephen King, you think it, you think Poltergeist. No, that started 82 Poltergeist, 86 for it. Right. It was all before any of that. 
It's easy to see how Poltergeist could have helped spread a clown scare. And of course, Stephen King's It. <laughs> I'll drive you crazy and I'll kill you all on every nightmare you ever had. I am your worst dream come true. But the fact that the 1981 scare preceded these cinematic killer clowns was telling. This wasn't just kids watching some movie, not when this fear was everywhere. Clowns appear in California, 1967, Newark, 1980, Boston, Providence, Omaha, Phoenix, Arizona, 1985, Chicago, Galveston, Texas, 1992, Washington, Maryland, Scotland, 1991, throughout a large portion of Latin America from Mexico to South America in the mid-90s. The question of how it's being spread is a very interesting one because you have an age group which doesn't have an enormous amount of contact, and especially in a pre-internet time, elementary schools communicating with students at other elementary schools uh, you know, on the other side of town is very unlikely. How it's transmitted is really one of the most intriguing, perhaps unsolved mysteries about it. All over the world, kids were seeing killer clowns but it could have been any monster. Zombies, vampires, witches. Why clowns? Maybe our fear points to an even larger issue. Maybe it was the clown's loss of innocence that made them that much more scary because it spoke to our own loss. For those born into a generation of stranger danger where missing kids appeared on every milk carton, clowns represented a world that had turned almost evil overnight. And that's because it's here in Chicago where the notion of killer clowns became a reality. Police found the decomposed remains of three bodies. They suspect there are several more bodies buried here. And the most evil of them all was Pogo, the alter ego of one of the most prolific serial killers in all of history, John Wayne Gacy. Gacy was a sadistic serial killer who brutally slayed 33 young men between 1972 and 1978 in the Chicago suburbs. Though many have portrayed Gacy as an actual killer clown, the truth behind his demented persona is not so simple. How many bodies did you find here? 29, mm -hmm. 20, 27 under the house mm -hmm. in the crawl space, mm -hmm. one under the driveway, mm -hmm. and one under the uh, uh, an extension that he put on the garage. This is Bob Egan, a former prosecutor on the Gacy case, and Cook County detective Jason Moran. When we first saw the Pogo the Clown pictures, we went, oh my God, is he, this guy acting as a clown to get victims? And that's what we thought. But it wasn't that at all. He was doing that because he was the center of attention. And everything he did was to make himself the center of attention. I still don't like clowns. <laughs> and I'm an adult with a gun and a badge. <laughs> and it might be from being a child during that time uh, because if you look at Pogo the Clown, he was, a very, he was a very creepy clown. If you look at the pictures, the makeup around his eyes when he was p portraying Pogo was triangular, and the makeup around his mouth came up to points. The clown expert said, clowns do not have any sharp points on their faces. Why? He says, because it scares kids and it connotes evil. And so you think Gacy did this on purpose to no, connote evil? No, I don't think at all. I think that's purely coincidental. He wasn't, I don't think he was thinking of that for one second. I'm telling you, that's exactly what we believed at the time. What was the clown issue was the subject of a lot of conversation during the trial trial. Although Gacy never did kill anyone dressed as a clown, he did tell police clowns can get away with murder, leading many to believe his signature clown look was in fact a true reflection of his inner evil self. Ken Melvin Berg is a noted historian who understands the dark side of a clown. It doesn't matter the type of mask that you're putting on, whether it's a clown face. It's to hide who you are a little bit and to be somebody a little bit different. It's oftentimes the opposite of what we portray ourselves in our day-to-day -day life. So somebody who is a truly evil person, like Gacy, puts it on to sort of offset that. What happens when people costume is that they're playing with these internal personalities. They're repressing the normal ego, and they are allowing some internal personality to become dominant. And so you put on the clown makeup, and you are no longer yourself. You then become someone that is unpredictable, possibly dangerous, possibly violent. Here we go. Game on, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> clowns has always been a huge thing for us here in Chicago. It's unlike any other American city where we have clowns and clown stories and clown mythology and clown history that no other city in the U.S. has. It started off um, a long time ago in the 1890s when the Columbian Exposition brought clowns around just to entertain folks. Going forward in time a little bit, up into the 1950s, like Bob Bell, who was the original Bozo the Clown, the Bozo set is still at WGN in the building, and it's allegedly haunted. The late 70s is when you had John Wayne Gacy, shortly after is when uh, clown panic happened. So for people like me that are a little bit sadistic, it makes it that much more interesting because people are that much more scared of clowns these days. The thing is that all of the people that were children in the 1980s and 1990s are adults now and are telling these terrifying tales of clowns to their children. Speaking of the connection to clowns in Chicago, the one site that you guys have got to see if you haven't been there before is Showman's Rest, which is a monument to the circus and clowns in a cemetery. Buried in Chicago are the clowns and other circus performers who died in one of the worst train wrecks in American history. On June 22nd, 1918, after its conductor fell asleep, a train plowed into the idle sleeper cars of the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. Those who weren't killed in the initial impact burned to death after the wooden cars caught on fire. In all, 86 performers were killed, with so many burned beyond recognition. They were buried in a mass grave in a section of a Chicago cemetery called Showman's Rest. One of those who survived was Joe Coyle, a famously jovial clown whose act became perpetually sad and morose as he took to dressing in rags. Coyle would play a sad clown for the rest of his life. Joe Coyle wept bitterly as he lay on a stretcher and told how his wife and two babies had joined him only recently and how all three had been crushed to death at his very side. The kiddies had been so glad to see their daddy, he said. I wish I could have died with them. Here, look, see that? Baldy. Baldy, 1918, June 22nd. They said they only could name him Baldy because that was the only name they knew him by. It was a stage name. Four horse driver, 1918. Unknown male, unknown male. Unknown male, unknown male, unknown male. All these graves are unknown? All these are unknown. Maybe it all started in Chicago with the deaths of these clowns. Maybe all it takes is a little tragedy to unlock the even darker places in our mind. One thing is for certain, there's no going back to the innocent clown. The scales have been tipped and the evidence proves it. Clowns can do scary things. They can even become killers. coming out of Aurora, Colorado, a scene of a shooting this morning, a movie theater where The Dark Knight Rises was being shown. On July 20th, 2012, James Holmes commits one of the worst mass shootings in recent history. But if the massacre itself weren't horrific enough, James's costuming was an ominous testament to the allure of a very specific clown. Introduce a little anarchy, upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. Holmes is embodiment of the Joker, a villain who has come to represent the ultimate destruction of our civilized world. Is no coincidence. In our never-ending attempts to sanitize society, we sometimes reap what we sow. In a sense, you can really look at it as a possible backlash. You felt this compulsion to water the clown down into this cartoonish, harmless being and I think the underlying traits of the archetype just came back with a vengeance. Holmes's Joker Field rampage not only signified that the clown's transformation from innocent to evil was finally complete, but it also revealed what was truly lurking inside of us all. We think of ourselves as one and in fact we're really kind of a parliament of personalities. The killer clown is one of our personalities, is part of us. And so, therefore, we have to be very careful not to let the killer clown out, except in a safe way, except in a playful way. 
See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> The Babysitter Killer, The Hook Man, The Halloween Sadist, The Killer Clown. What can we learn from these urban legends and from the true crimes that may have inspired them? Maybe these monsters, despite our overwhelming desire to believe otherwise, just aren't real. By presenting false boogeymen, our urban legends are helping us to make sense of crimes too wicked to comprehend. An urban legend, even though it can be scary, it's not nearly as scary as the actual murderers that live in the world with us. But peel back the layers of any campfire tale, and you'll understand the inherent truth that despite our need to believe in an evil, in a darker force, it just isn't true. In the end, the only real boogeyman is the one that lurks inside of us all, waiting for just the right moment to emerge. So what's the lesson behind this cautionary tale? The warning here is simple. Be afraid, not of the story, but of the storyteller. Every town has its legends. Every neighborhood has its boogeyman. A killer with a hook for a hand. The drifter who snatches children. The witch who lives in the woods. Ours growing up in Staten Island was Cropsy, about an escaped mental patient who lived in these buildings who had snatched children off the street. This urban legend turned real when five neighborhood children went missing. It was these disappearances that led us to examine the real crimes behind the Cropsey urban legend. A grisly discovery of an arm and a leg sticking out from a shallow grave. And what we discovered was a connection to an institution with a shocking history. This is what it looked like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. Understanding the real story behind Cropsey inspired us to investigate other urban legends and the true crimes that may have influenced them. And what we uncovered was a truth more horrific than any fiction. Later, as the boyfriend goes to open his date's door, he sees dangling from the door handle the maniac's bloody hook ripped from its socket. The hook urban legend probably uh, came to be in the mid-1950s. One of the interesting appearances of the hook was in November 1960, when it actually appeared in the Dear Abby column, and it's something that a lot of people would have read. But Dear Abby wasn't warning teenagers about escaped man-man with hooks for hands. Urban legends are more mysterious than that, and never quite so literal. Despite its name, the hook is a cautionary tale, warning teenagers everywhere about the dangers of sex. The hook urban legend captured something in the era that, that people were interested in. It captured a certain amount of danger being involved in teenage sexual behavior and in teenage car culture. For the teenagers in Texarkana, Texas, this wasn't just some cautionary tale. In the early spring of 1946, a masked man known as the Phantom attacked four couples, most of whom were parked on lovers' lanes. The attacks, which killed five, 
were said to coincide with the full moon, hence the nickname, the Moonlight Murders. And although there were numerous suspects, the Phantom was never caught, allowing his enduring legacy to haunt this town for more than six decades. So this is South Robeson, and this is Old Highway 67. The murder site is somewhere around here, but that's I guess. What do you guys expect to find out here? People who died here are supposed to be the ghosts. Do you believe that they're devil worshippers? Oh, yeah, I do. I do. Somebody said they were doing freaky experiments and crap like that. Why do we believe these urban legends? Maybe we need to believe, because the reality is too much for some of us to bear. No legend that actually happened this time. Many more cases of contaminated treats. I know she suffered a lot. He pulled a knife and tied me up with electrical tape. <laughs> and so instead, to create our own monsters. A 36-year-old building contractor who reportedly dressed like a clown. At least three young boys buried under his house. And maybe that's because the truth is more terrifying than we could ever imagine. They got seven down in feet or not. Seven down. Got a child victim. I need rescue. For Rachel and me, this is an attempt to uncover the source of our nightmares as we pull back the curtains on what it is we all fear. Because urban legends, as scary as they may be, are really just warnings for something much more dangerous. The reality that may have started it all. The Hook is one of the oldest and also one of the scariest urban legends. A teenage couple are making out in their car while parked at a lover's lane. As the two are about to go all the way, the radio interrupts them. A crazed maniac with a hook for a hand has escaped from the local insane asylum. The frightened girl demands to go home as the frustrated boy guns the engine. Cropsy live in these buildings here. It's very easy for an urban legend to come out of something like this. Yeah. And we didn't think anything of it until kids started going missing on Staten Island. And then we were like, Cropsy's real. But do you think every urban legend has truth behind it? Yes, I think you have to have some form of like truth to kind of go off of. There's a lot of other urban legends and a lot of other communities that have some form of truth behind them. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is all these communities have all these places. Well, every kid is lured to or fascinated by the old house at the end of their block. These are the stories that fuel your nightmares, and these are the places that fuel your nightmares. So why are you here tonight? You hear stories, you just want to see what's about. What we got to come figure out. It was a rainy, sunny morning on March 24th when a passing motorist noticed Richard Griffin's Oldsmobile parked on a lover's lane off Highway 67. Inside, he found Griffin, age 29, and Polly Ann Moore, 17, lying in the back seat. Both had been shot in the back of the head. Hey, guys, how you doing? What we're doing is we're investigating the Phantom Killer. They had a lot of speculations on who did it, but it was never, no one was ever brought to justice. Did you hear stories growing up? All I ever heard was, don't go to Spring Lake Park. Really? Uh -huh. Why? It's kind of creepy out there, so but we were always afraid to go there. <laughs> but did you still go? <laughs> no. We're having a little trouble finding out where the area is, but because everything's Well, changing. I can take you out there to the, to the road and point to almost a spot. Right about there. Uh-huh. Right on, on that side. On that side. On that side. Like the couple in the urban legend, Griffin and Moore had been attacked while parked on Lover's Lane, highlighting the warning behind this campfire tale. But what the residents in Texarkana didn't know, because it wasn't reported in the papers, were the horrific details behind this real-life crime. They had found evidence of blood and a blanket, mm -hmm. and they believed that she was raped out in front of the car and then put back in the car. The first double murder didn't cause a lot of excitement. All kinds of crimes were going in in Texarkana, but they didn't recognize till sometime 
later that this is a different kind of crime. The term